أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله الحمد لله الذي أنزل الفرقان على عبده ليكون للعالمين نذيرا والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق ونور عرش أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المأسومين المظلومين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتاب المجيد وقوله الحق وهو أصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الله اشترى من المؤمنين أنفسهم وأموالهم بأن لهم الجنة يقاتلون في سبيل الله فيقتلون ويقتلون وعدا عليه حقا في التوراة والإنجيل والقرآن ومن أوفى بأحده من الله فاستبشروا ببيعكم الذي بايعتم به وذلك هو الفوز العظيم صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات الله محمد وعلي محمد I begin in Allah's name, who is most worthy of praise. He owns the universe, He owns us. We are only alive because of Him. And we have eternity because of Him. And He has placed us on this earth with the capacity to select right and to avoid wrong. And Allah wants us to be upright and He is testing us. One of the highest forms of God's mercy is the test. Because Allah wants you and I to participate in His mercy. For were Allah to place us in paradise directly, you and I would not have participated in that high achievement. But the fact that you and I can damn ourselves to hell, or we can raise ourselves to Maqam Mahmud, or Jannatul Fardaus, is within our destiny. And Allah considers us worthy of representing ourselves on this earth and to decide our own destiny. I think that's phenomenal. If you really think about it, that Allah considers me and you capable of struggling enough to enter paradise, I think that's incredible. You know, when you look at somebody says, well, this person is not capable, so I don't even want to consider them. But for God to consider us to represent Him and to participate in His mercy, so that we continue to receive from His infinite grace, I think is a lot to speak about. When we talk about Karbala and the sacrifices of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, Allahumma salli ala. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. And his family and his companions and all the people in life who continue to sacrifice even after Karbala. As you know, the Tawabin who came from Kufa, came and really stood up against the Umayyads after realizing their ignominy. And of course the sacrifices of today, where our lovers of Ahlul Bayt have sacrificed to cut the tentacles of Iblis that has entangled them into this very complicated web of satanic elements. And when the revolutions have taken place and pushed them aside, the devil has come with venom to try to um, subdue them and to destroy them. And that sacrifice in modern day today is a testament to the fact that when you and I follow this Quranic principle and Ahlul Bayt are the ultimate representatives of the Quran in its fullest form, that you and I become beneficiaries. But then we have to understand what's the function and purpose of life. So within this scale of trials and tribulations that you and I have been um, decreed by Allah, when Allah so, and I recite more of this tomorrow, inshallah, in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah says, وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُوعِ وَنَقْصِ مِنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنْفُسِ وَالثَّمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ I'll test you, fear, loss of fruits, life, every trial, tribulation you and I can think of, right? that you and I can have that incredible amount of fear, khawf, will be trembling. Allah says, وَبَشِّرِ sabirin Give good news to the patient ones. Here, sabirin, 
and I'll discuss it more tomorrow, more pertinent tomorrow especially, because of the, the night of Ashura, the night of the day, it was the night before the massacre took place. There was a lot to discuss. And there's nothing higher that Allah exemplifies in the Quran uh, within the principles of character and morality than a person who has uh, ironclad belief in sabr. You know, Ismail says to his father, Satajiduni, inshallah, minas sabirin. In, inshallah Allah will find me among the patient ones when Allah has told you to sacrifice me. Adbahuka, meaning inni arafil manam, I've seen in my dreams I must, I must sacrifice you. Tonight we will talk about that sacrifice of Ali Akbar alayhi salam, Imam Hussein alayhi salam sacrificing his son on the battlefield, not with his sword, but with the enemy's sword, but still to, to send your son forward, that sacrifice what is the root uh, principle of managing trials and tribulations in life? Uh, sabr, patience. We must train this young generation how to exercise patience. Today, in the technology world, everything is instantaneous. There's a lot of instant, what we call gratification systems. There was a time when we grew up, we patiently waited for results. You know, we would walk and wait for the news. Now it's like at your fingertips and children have become very, very much, very impatient. It's a world where patience is moving away. But research shows, even Stanford had done a study showing in general that children who are taught to practice patience are more successful in life. For they know how to manage conflict. They're able to be more successful because their decision-making processes are more clear. And of course, characteristically, a person who swallows their anger due to patience, where Allah says, وَالْقَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْظِ وَالْعَافِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ You know, in this verse of the Qur'an, is so elegant. وَسَارِعُ إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ أَرْضُ وَالسَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضُ عِدَّتْ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ فِي السَّرَّاءِ وَالْدَرَّاءِ وَالْكَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْظِ وَالْعَفِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ وَاللَّهِ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ This verse is elegant. Hasten to forgiveness. Where a paradise awaits you bigger than the earth and sky put together. Meaning Allah says, I've guaranteed you, if you are within the frame of patience and istighfar, وَسَارِيُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةِ As I mentioned the other day, what is istighfar? Forgiveness and protection. Constantly seek protection from God. Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. In fact, one of the conditions of reciting talaq, when you're going to a divorce, it's not a good thing to do, but the condition is you should read three istighfar so that you are pure in understanding that you are pronouncing a, a break in marriage. Istighfar. You must do istighfar. In salah, istighfar. In life, istighfar. Here, the Allah says, wasari'u. Hasten to istighfar. But if you do that, there is a paradise that awaits you. Ardu samawatu wal ardh. lil muttaqin. It's a calling for the ones who are God conscious, ones who are aware, ones who have sat down and thought and reflected and accused themselves and made a pact with themselves to be upright and to avoid the evils of this world and to sacrifice their wealth and their selves for the love of God. Or iddat lil muttaqeen. Who are they? Alladheena yunfiquna fi sarra wad They give charity in good times and in bad times. Even when they are poor, they give charity. Not necessarily with money, but with their selves, with their smile, with their kind words. Sarra wad وَالْكَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْذِ They swallow their anger. Imam, as you know, Musab Najafar al-Kaathin, Salawat ala Muhammad al When I was at his grave in Kaathimeen, you know, I was holding his grave. And as you know, even the grave of his son, if you look at that, when you're next to it and you're looking at him and say, well, I want that character of yours. Yeah, Imam. 
just your ability to swallow anger. For I'm suffering on this earth with my negligence and lack of patience. And give me, Ya Allah, through this blessed Imam, this power to swallow my anger. Kadimin al ghayth And then, what happens after that? Wal'afin anin nas. Oh my God. <laughs> I tell you, if mankind just followed these two principles, Kadhimin al Ghaid, Wal Afin al Nas, this world would be paradise. You and I wouldn't need to put locks on our doors. We wouldn't need to dispense any medications generally unless it was something that was congenital. We wouldn't have to do a lot of things. This life would be peaceful, peaceful. Because this, the first paradise is here. This earth is a paradise. Okay, don't think it's hell. This earth is the first paradise. Allah says it's in your hand on how you make it a paradise. If you abuse it, it becomes hell. If you submit to me, it becomes paradise. I'm a firm believer that if people obeyed Rasulullah, you see, when he said, Man kuntum mawla fahadha aliyun mawla Allahumma wali man wala wa adi man a'da wansur man nasara wa khdul man khadala when Allah says, Ya ayya rasul balligh ma unzila ilayka min rabbik wa in lam taf'al fa ma balaghta risalata. Wallahu ya'asimuka min al-nas if mankind would have listened, those believers in Mecca and Medina, and obeyed the messenger and not be jealous, I think this world would have already started to be a paradise. And I think you and I would not need cars. You and I would be moving the way the throne of Bilqis moved to Sulaiman with tarfat al ain with the blink of an eye. But we have shot ourselves in the foot. But Allah says it's okay. It was by design that I allowed you to slip and therefore you slipped and you're going to pay the price. But I just want us to know that this world was not created as an environment of hell by God. The hell that's taking place today with evildoers is because the majority is silent. Society is driven by vocal minorities, never driven by vocal majority. There's no such thing. We talk about democracy in America or in Canada. There is no real democracy in the world for the people, with the people, by the people. No. Special interest groups rule. We think we're ruling. Okay? And politicians will realign, like what's happening in Gaza, and people are starving. So America tries to save its face, so it puts a nice little floating pier that doesn't work. You know, that kind of gets washed away. So we're trying, you know, <laughs> we're trying to get food to these poor guys. I say, you control the world, you drop 2,000 pound bombs on people, you can't even put food on their tables. But well, we gotta ha have to save face. But that's because society is making a stink out of it. But the devil says, I'm gonna continue to kill. So what you find is in relationship to democracy, it's the vocal minority that <coughs> rules. And usually, if the vocal minority is evil, see, Muawiyah was evil, Abu Sufyan was evil, Yazid was evil. They were a vocal minority. The Umayyads were a vocal minority. The majority was wishy-washy. Either they were munaf, they were like ambivalent. They were not committed. And then on the other side, there was the vocal minority of Imam Hussein on the side of God. Two sides. And they're both ruled, if you understand, that both sides have to make a voice. But it's the silent majority that needs to sort of align. Imam Hussein's message was entirely to that silent majority. What are you doing? Zainab salam, when she enters Kufa and they're lamenting, she says, how dare you lament now when you were silent when my brother called you? You were the majority in Kufa. You all had to do was this and get rid of Ibn Ziyad. And you all ran away. Like cowards. What happened? All you had to do was rise. But that's the idea. And I, what I find extremely powerful is that the message of Karbala is bringing the silent majority into focus on what it needs to do. And I love that. That the essence of the tragedy of Karbala is causing humanity to move towards what we call 
a silent majority that is going to align with the vocal min minority that is correct and not that is incorrect. So I'm just making a quick point here with, reg with regards to our obligation that when you look at our imams, how they struggled, you will see that society is run by two groups, either vocal minority of evil or the vocal minority of good. Karbala was precisely that. That majority that fought was wrapped around, and Imam Hussein alayhi salam mentions that, that you have been bought, you have been sold, you have sold your souls to the devil. And hence the majority starts to follow and destruction starts. But this earth is a paradise. Trust me. I walk around. In fact, one, there's a hadith, Imam Ali alayhi salam says, I love this world. I love dunya. People said, Amir al-Mu'mineen, you tell us dunya is where bala is. Dunya is, is a distraction. You know, you tell us that this world is fleeting. He said, no, no, you didn't understand. He said, dunya hasn't denied me my right. When did the sun refuse to rise? When did the moon refuse to shine? <laughs> when did the stars refuse to guide? Imam Ali Alayhi so elegantly is describing what has been denied of my Lord on this earth in my comforts. It's a fleeting world because of the injustices, because of the irregularities when it comes to submission to God, when it comes to kufr and rejection and the promotion of evil and the demotion of good that makes this world such an ugly place. So this is just an introduction tonight within this time that I have that we, you and I to practice patience on this transient earth which is the first level of paradise you and I require the power of istighfar and submission to Allah. But what is the core component of patience? I'm just going to introduce it tonight. Salawat ala Muhammad ala Muhammad. It is pegged in time, for patience is a connotation of time. When I'm patiently waiting, meaning I am going to forego what my desires are now, or somebody is saying something bad to me right now, I will be silent and inshallah it will pay back tomorrow. You notice by the way, people who are patient, even if they are wrong, they look right. People who are impatient, even if they are right, they look wrong. It's an interesting fact. When you get angry, for example, and you're getting into a quick argument with somebody, and you're right, but you look impatient, people just think, that they just don't think you're right. But even if you're wrong and you just, you know, uh, silent, and you let it pass, people say, oh wow, this guy must be really right, because he was patient. Because the quality of patience by nature has a good uh, character. It's, it's a good khulq, you know, it's the nature of a patient person. Now what is patient? Patience is pegged in time. And there are three components within time, in a very generic fashion. And I ask my students at our institution often on this question, because I think it's very important to train our children to understand the principles of time. When Allah says, Wal asrin al insan al you know, and all in Surah Al Dahar, Halata al insanu, hinu mina dahri, lam yakun shayin madhkura. Allah is saying, pay attention to time. Time is a vector you can't take back, and every millisecond that's passing, it's forever past. And if you don't grab it, when it's supposed to be grabbed, opportunity-wise, opportunity you may never get it back. So within this frame of time, in a simple conversation to this audience, I would say that there are three basic components. Past, present, and future. You all agree? Yes, very basic components. If I ask my audience, I ask my students, of the three, which is the most important? And I want you to think, and one brother just said, now. Is it the most important? Is now the most important? If you go to a happy-go-lucky guy on the, on the street, hanging out at the beach, he tell you the same thing. Yeah, now, you know, who cares about yesterday, who cares about tomorrow? What's now is important. But actually, that's not where it stands. If you study the Quran, Allah says, be careful of now. But everything about now is the product of the past and is the making of the future. Therefore, the most important component in time is the future. 
not now. <laughs> See, now you can be famous and you can be rich and everybody loves you. And tomorrow you will be hated and you'll have nothing and everybody hates you. That thought is depressing. Because the future is superior to now. But now I'm rich, I'm famous, I'm happy, I'm peaceful, I have a nice palace. Yeah, but tomorrow you're going to be bankrupt. And you'll be very unhappy. And you'll be sick. And maybe you'll be in hell. Well, I don't like that. So now is not the most important. Reverse the image. Now you're in difficulty. You have nothing. You're in the hospital. You're suffering. The world hates you. But tomorrow, you're free. You're in paradise. You're with the prophet in Pool of Kawthar. You're with the prophets. You're with the imams. <laughs> and you're eternally in bliss. Which one's better? Ask anybody. They'll tell you. The second one, of course. Yeah, but now you're suffering. It's difficult. It's painful. I don't care as long as my future is safe. This is Karbala. The principles of Karbala within the frame of time is this. Exactly. That when you look at the companions, now I am looking at them. People used to mock at them. The Bani Umayyah said, we won. Yazid said, I won. Zainab says, no, you didn't win. Watch. Now you are in an illusion you think you won. But you will see who won in time. And in eternity, you will see who won. So you and I are in this gathering. You, you and I have to pack this within ourselves that constantly look. Pay attention what you are sending tomorrow. Be careful what you're sending tomorrow. Look at the disbelievers. Allah says, أَنْشَأَكُمْ وَجَعَلَ لَكُمُ السَّمْعَ وَالْأَبْصَارَ وَالْأَفْئِدَةِ قَلِيلًا مَا تَشْكُرُونَ قُلْ هُوَ الَّذِي ذَرَعَكُمْ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَإِلَيْهِ تُحْشَرُونَ وَيَقُولُونَ مَتَى هَذَا الْوَعْدُ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ قُلْ إِنَّمَا الْعِلْمُ عِنَّ اللَّهِ وَإِنَّمَا أَنَا نَذِيرٌ مُبِينٌ فلما رأوه زلفة سيئت وجوه الذين كفروا وقيل هذا الذي كنتم به تدعون قل أرأيت من أهلكني الله ومن معي أو رحمنا فمن يجير الكافرين من عذاب أليم قل هو الرحمن آمنا به وعليه توكلنا فستعلمون من هو في ضلال مبين It's a verse, Surah Al-Mulk Allah says I give you life, I give you hearing, I give you heart, I give you sight how little you are grateful. Khalilan ma tashkurun. I spread you on earth. Look how much I've spread you. Five continents that humans occupy. There are seven, but five are inhabitable. Look, I have spread you on them. But I will gather you. All of you, you'll be gathered tomorrow. See, time again. Quran is constantly making me aware of tomorrow, 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 tomorrow. You look at all prophets in Ahlul Bayt, you ask them, how do you have such faith in God? Why doesn't shaitan get you? Their vision of tomorrow was yaqeen. وَبِلْ hum yuqinun. They have yaqeen. They, they see tomorrow like now. إِنَّهُمْ يَرَوْنَهُ بَعِيدًا وَنَرَاهُ قَرِيبًا They see far tomorrow Allah says watch out that's shaitan's game he wants you to enjoy now it's like a salesperson don't worry about the consequence of the payments you have to make in this nice little thing you're gonna buy it's nice sit in it T touch it isn't it feel good yeah I love it you should buy it how much is this it's five thousand dollars a month oh I, I can barely afford it but don't worry about it you'll make it somehow you, you it'll be paid and then you start to sweat once you buy it. Shaitan got you. But a wise person says, excuse me, it's not within my frame of being able to spend that kind of money. Person who thinks, well, why, why are you stopping? Well, how am I going to manage this in the next 60 months? I'm thinking of the 60 months. I don't have that capacity. Future thinking. Quran is constant about future thinking. Okay? So of the three, you find in the Quran, Allah says, we spread you on earth, we will... Bring you back. Look at the kafir. 
Who's the disbeliever? He says, Mata al wa'du. When? When will this happen? Atheists, agnostics, disbelievers. I was reading Surah Al-Mu'minun. Prophet Nu is talking to his people and they're laughing at him. <laughs> you, a mortal who eats like us, you're warning us of tomorrow? <laughs> they were laughing. Nu alayhi salam said, Rabbin surni bima kaddabun. Save me from these people who call me a liar. And Allah says, leave them alone. I will get them fast. And when I get them, they won't even be able to change their expression on their faces. You know, when Lut was visited by Jibrail, Mikael, Israfil, and Israel in the nighttime, and they said, tomorrow this town will be demolished. Lut asks Jibrail, why not tonight? He said, what's the difference? When God has decreed, it'll happen. You want to know the difference. For tomorrow, when it is decreed, is like now. So when you and I want to live an upright life now, you and I better live tomorrow. Every signature you and I sign in an agreement, see it as tomorrow. Day of judgment. I'm going to answer God about this signature. I shook hands with this person and told him something. I'm going to answer that tomorrow so I better sign it now correctly but those who don't think of tomorrow who cares about tomorrow I promise you I'll pay you back and then tomorrow comes and they have amnesia they say when you borrow money it's like a wedding night and when it comes time to pay back it's like the funeral <laughs> I can't pay it back well because you weren't thinking of tomorrow a disbeliever doesn't think of tomorrow. So they're asking the Prophet, Mata had al wa'du. We don't believe in the day of judgment. You know, Richard Carey asked me that same question in, my, in the second debate. It's a foolish question. Foolish. How do you know the day of judgment exists? The question is, he's basically asking me, how do you know tomorrow exists? So I asked him, I said, you put money in the bank? He said, yes. I said, you and I agreed on this debate months ago. How did you know today will come? In atheistic mind, today didn't exist. Three months ago, today did not exist. Yet you had faith in today? And he looked at me. I said, my faith is eternal. So I'm wiser than you because a fool thinks short term. A wise man thinks long term. <laughs> Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So Allah replies the Prophet, says, tell them, قُلْ إِنَّمَا الْعِلْمُ عِنَّ اللَّهِ That knowledge is with God. And Allah says, if you believe in me and in the ghaybah, and you look around and see my masterful creation, and you see how time works, and you are so pegged and bound in it, and you function within its principles, for you use time all the time. And you make promises and you set moments of meeting people and you look forward to that time. This is your life. Allah says, Why are you ignoring the real time? And I am a plain warner. I, the Prophet does not know the day of judgment, nobody knows the day of judgment. Allah can tell the Prophet when the Day of Judgment will take place. As Allah says, وَلَا يُحِيطُونَ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنْ عِلْمِهِ إِلَّا بِمَا شَاء Nobody, no Imam, no Prophet can avail of any knowledge except what Allah gives them. For that's true Tawheed. And when you and I, by the way, do Shifa'a with our Imams, people ask me that question. Whatever we ask the Imams, know that it is the authority God has given them to be able to answer me. It is not the Imam who is my God. Please understand that. And don't stop doing that, please. For that disconnection from the agents of God is what leads to Salafism and Wahhabism and ISIS. Ruthless. Allahu Akbar and they behead like the Khawarij who fought Imam Ali in Nahrawan. They prayed all day, but they were disconnected from the agency of God. Though they read the Quran, but they were so stupid that they thought the Quran would walk and talk. When Imam says, I am the walking Quran, you 
foolish people. Don't you understand? So when people say to you, don't, don't do shifa with them. Somebody asked me a very nice question yesterday. He said, but that's, they're not here. You see, when, when Yusuf's children, I mean, when Yaqub's children, Yusuf's brother, asked their father to pray for them after Yusuf comes back, y Yusuf's father was alive. <laughs> I've heard these people telling me this. Our Shia is telling me this. I said, how did you come up with this thing? The, uh, the Imams are not alive. They're in Ghaibah. Brothers and sisters, please, 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 I can't stress this enough. Our Imams are not dead. We see, Assalamu alaikum ya Aba Abdullah al Hussein. Assalamu alaikum ya Ibn Rasulillah. Hmm? In Salah, we know our Prophet died 1400 years ago. We say, Assalamu alaikum, ayyuhan nabiyu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In Salah, how do you send Salam to the Prophet in Salah when your Prophet has died? And here's the clincher one. Yeah, but they're not here, so there's no effect. I said, why? And by the way, this brother is sincere. And what he's asking me is excellent. And may Allah bless him for asking me this. So that I can express it to the world. So I looked at him, I said, do you recite Audhu Billahi Minash Shaitan al Rajim? He said, I do. I said, why? He said, I want to protect myself from Iblis. I said, how can he harm you if he's not visible? You and I all believe Shaitan harms us. And he's in Ghaibah. He's hidden. How is he harming me? So then you're going to should stop swing, saying, Audhu Billah. So one needs not be physically present for me to ask for Shifa. So when I go to the graves of our Imams, I don't need to see the Imam for Shifa. The agency of God is alive within us. And Allah says, do you recognize them? Even thousand years later, do you recognize my prophets? Adam came first. Allah says, do you recognize him as my prophet? Yeah, Allah, he came thousands of years ago, tens of thousands of years. It's got nothing to do with me now. Allah says, do you recognize him? And Allah says, if you don't, you are not a Muslim. Wow, really? Thousands of years ago, I need to recognize him. Allah says, my shifa'a. Inni ja'ilun fil ardi khalifa. He is my khalifa. Did you recognize him? For if you didn't, your salah is questionable. So when it comes to shifa'a, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, all my agents have shifa'a. They're alive. لا تقولوا لمن يقتلوا في سبيل الله أموات بل أحياء ولكن لا تشعرون. Do not say that they are dead. Rather, you cannot see them. What verse can you bring that negates this centrality of the Quran's forceful expression to say, don't say, لا تقولوا. Allah didn't say, you should not say, لا تقولوا. Do not say, for they are alive. And the Rabbihim yurzaqoon. Allah even expresses it further. From their Lord, they are receiving sustenance. Sustenance are for living people, not for dead people. Salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. So Allah is asking, and they're asking, Mata had al wa'ad. People don't believe in the future as one. Number two, they don't want the day of judgment. Why is atheism having difficulty? They don't want to be judged. <coughs> but if you look at the most elegant system in life, it's about judgment. The day you and I are born, you see with AI, I mentioned yesterday in the Q&A, those of you who were there, in AI and technology and computer world, you can shut off systems. <coughs> A computer can be very intelligent, can give you answers, can even mimic human qualities. But that entity that is manufactured does not have consciousness, lacks consciousness. What is consciousness? It doesn't have responsibility. There is no what we call punitive threats, meaning it cannot be thrown into hell, nor does it desire eternal bliss in paradise. It has no consciousness. When Allah says, alaykum and fusakum, take care of yourselves. When Allah says,
يا ايها الذين امنوا قوا انفسكم واهليكم نار نار الله سبحانه وتعالى is saying save yourselves and your family from hell conscious i have something waiting for me if i don't behave properly ai doesn't have that it lacks consciousness so therefore when the human being who's born is given life you can't shut them off by the way when a person dies and their soul leaves their body we say take the body of this person and let's move it but that person you never call that person the body you never look at a person and say, can you please move your body towards me you know uh, can you can you bring your body towards me you don't say that. can you come towards me but when you're dead you say move the body well, what's the difference well the difference is the person has left his body is there but that person hasn't shut off allah says they hear you they see you but they cannot reply you they haven't turned off that's why it's dha'iqa dha'iqa in arabic means to taste you don't become fana you just move from your body out into what you call jism mithali you move to another state of existence so you're alive always alive and here's the miracle forever even in hell allah says thumma la yamutu fiha wa la yahya but you're aware you're constantly aware forever allah says that's my mercy upon you that i have put something in you yas'alunaka ani ruh qul ruh min amri rabbi they ask you about this soul that keeps you alive allah says that's in my command i gave it to you when i look at an insect and i say i look at it say, it's moving i say that's a living entity it's alive now i can step on it it'll be dead but its soul will move really an insect soul insect has a soul yeah a bird has a soul it leaves and it goes into that alam in in a state where allah will reward it paradise for its existence in its own world of insecthood that's the rahm of allah a fish when it dies an animal when it gets slaughtered when its soul leaves allah says i take it and i give it eternal existence in its own existential nature that's how beautiful this world is but you will notice that a disbeliever doesn't want to be held liable on tomorrow but a wise person says it's inevitable what else do i have even imam jafar sadiq alayhi salatu wassalam states it's known as pascal's wager it's a wager it's a it's a wager it's called pascal but it wasn't pascal's wager that's a modern day expression imam jafar sadiq told ibn abi awja already when he was debating with him at the kaaba he said ya ibn abi awja he looks at him and says you don't believe in god you're an atheist but what if god is there tomorrow what's your evidence isn't it better that you upright moral with this belief and then if you die and become nothing there is no consequence but what if it is isn't it better to secure yourself now it's like going through the jungle you don't know if the lion will attack you so i don't know if i should take the gun with me well what you're foolish like you know take a guard and guard yourself yeah but i don't know if the animals will attack me so i'm i'm not going to take it so if you don't know you won't what a foolish idea and when an atheist comes and says i don't believe in god the messenger of allah says why he says i didn't see him create the prophet said then if he didn't create who did he says i don't know so the prophet looks and says if you don't know how do you know god didn't create <laughs> subhanallah shaitan this is shaitan talking you are is fooling a person why they don't want to believe in the day of judgment they are refusing to be held liable but allah says and the prophet said it is wiser for you to this atheist for you to be an agnostic than for you to be an atheist because an atheist is a blind leap of faith for lack of um, evidence is never evidence for an argument so how did you conclude this is jahiliya subhanallah how elegant it is i don't want to go too deep into this but the day of judgment it's all about the day of judgment allah says in who's the believer in uh, in alladhina amanu wal ladhina hadu wan nasara was sabiin man amana billahi wal yawm al akhir wa amila salih three components allah said la khawfun alayhim wal am yahzanun three components who believe in allah day right day of judgment and do good deeds allah says and look at quran is the only book by the way that addresses jews 
Christians, Sabi'in, Sabians by name. The Bible doesn't, the Torah doesn't, the Quran addresses the whole major human race by name and says, come, let's talk. And Allah says two core components you must believe in, Allah and the Day of Judgment. What's in between is natural, prophethood, wilaya, it has to come. So Allah has already encapsulated us in this verse, but He's saying to you, obey this and follow this. لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون There is no fear for you and don't be stressed. That's a verse in the Quran? Allah says, yeah, it's amazing how much Allah has blessed us. So final point here is, Allah says, who are my believers? They say, إِنَّ النَّخَافُ مِنْ رَبِّنَا يَوْمًا عَبُوسًا قَمْتَرِيرًا When Allah says, who are they? يُفُونَ بِالنَّذْرِ وَيَخَافُونَ يَوْمًا كَانَ شَرُّهُ مُسْتَطِيرًا I recited the other day, they give food to the poor, to the wayfarer, to the orphan. And they say, subhanAllah, this was Fatima al-Zahra sallallahu alayhi wa Imam Hassan, Imam Hussain alayhi salam, and she made another that they are sick as a result. I'm going to fast for three days. And as they're about to break their fast on the first day, you see, uh, an orphan comes, a wayfarer comes, you know, a miskin comes, miskin and wa yatim. And it, the, the chronology was there, miskin, yatim and asir, meaning the, the, the poor, the orphan and the wayfarer. Each one, each day came and they gave away most of their foods. They barely had anything to break. And Allah loved them so much for keeping their promises and for caring for humanity that Imam Hussein alayhi salam in Karbala, in front of Yazid's army, he says, I am a dahar. That Surah Al-Dahar that Allah is talking about, that's me. We were the ones who kept that promise. Imam describes it to the people of uh, in, in Karbala, the people who came to attack him. And in that statement, the people tell them that you, you've done a great thing. They say, Innama nut'imukum, we feed you li wajhillah for the love of God. Because we understand who Allah is. We know what the day of judgment is. We know why we were created. We know why we're here. And we know where we are going. And we know exactly how to plan our future. La nuridu minkum jaza'an wa la shukura. Most of us do things for what? For jaza'an and shukura. What's in it for me? How much are you going to plaster my name on the wall? How famous am I going to become? I'm going to donate. Can you plaster my name somewhere? لا نريد منكم جزاء ولا شكورا إننا نخاف من ربنا We are afraid of that day from our Lord when we will be held accountable that Allah is so merciful to us and if we were not just and not loving and caring and giving and forgiving then Allah will hold us liable for not doing this لوجه الله my respected sisters and brothers in Islam and in humanity, please follow this. For there is nothing that awaits us more than that day of judgment that is so guaranteed that Allah talks about it in Surah Al-Waqiyah and we'll talk about it in other lectures where Allah describes with graphic details exactly what eschatology is about in Islam and it's amazing. But if you and I can grab it now, as a child or as an adult, and say, I'm going to plan my future. I have a wish and a dream. When I was a teenager, I said, how do I pay my parents back for the good that they've done? Do I buy them palaces? Do I make a lot of money and feed them and make them happy? I said, but that's transient. They will grow old, they will die, they will leave it behind. So then what should I do for my parents for I love them so much? How can I pay back? Something told me, how about you become a witness for them on Judgment Day? And how about you tell God that all the good you did was because of them? And how about you pray to God that, Ya Allah, grant them the highest stations forever, for that is the gift through the mercy of God, through my little action that I've done. Isn't that the best vision to have? My brothers and sisters, when you and I shake hands, shake hands for the Day of Judgment. When we say, I love you, love a person for the Day of Judgment. When you love Ahlul Bayt, love them forever. When you love your wife and your spouse and your children and your parents and your friends and your neighbors, love them for Yawmul Qiyamah. That's all I can say tonight. Tonight, subhanAllah, we are commemorating Ali Akbar. Ali Akbar was the son of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. He was a teenager. He was, in his, he was 20 years old, some say. He was 21 years of age, quite young. And I conclude in this, but there's so much. This verse I recited, by the way, in Surah Tawbah. Let me, let me translate so you understand this conversation, its finality. 
Surely Allah has bought of the believers their persons and their property for this, that they shall have the garden, meaning they have given, they have sold their souls to Allah for perpetuity in dunya wal akhirah. They fight in Allah's way, so they slay and are slain. Meaning they fight. Yuqatiluna wa yuqtal, right? A promise which is binding on him in the Torah and the Injil and the Quran. And who is more faithful to his covenant than Allah? Rejoice therefore in the pledge which you have made. You made a pledge to Allah, you sold yourself. Ali Akbar tonight, us yesterday, we were talking, all of them, they all sold their souls. All of them, from childhood. They could see them, they were understanding. And that is the mighty achievement. What does Allah continue to say? They who turn to Allah, who serve Him, who praise Him, who fast, who bow down, who prostrate themselves, who enjoin what is good and forbid what is evil, and who keep the limits of Allah, give good news to the believers. That's the principles of life. Ali Akbar is on the horse going towards Kufa and he's being pushed towards Karbala. His father says, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi rajiun, as I mentioned. He looks at his father and he says, Father, what is it? He said, I have just seen the Prophet calling us. We are soon going to see him. That impending death, which is now reaching the end of life for a 20, 21 year old, to me is monumental in life. You know, a 70, 80, 90 year old saying it, maybe because, you know, they have understood more experience, more spirituality. But for a young, vibrant person who material world is so attractive, to say that, and looks at his father and says, are we not on haq, ya fa oh father? Are we not on haq? He said, yes, we are on haq. He says, then let us move. Let us go. And Imam looks at him and says, how blessed I am. Now historians say that Ali Akbar was a spitting image of the Prophet. If you looked at him, you thought you're looking at the Prophet Junior. His demeanor, his voice, his character was a copy of the Prophet. So as Imam Hussain alayhi salam is sending his son, he says, Allahumma shahid, faqad baraza ilayhim ghulamun ashbahu nas khalqan wa khulqan wa mantiqan bi rasulik wa kunna idha shtaqna ila nabiyika nadharna ilayha. As Ali Akbar is put on the horse, as you know, his mother was Layla. And he goes, before he goes on that horse, he goes, seeks permission from his aunt, Zainab. And when he enters the room, Zainab laments. She said, How can I let you go? For every time I remember my grandfather, I look at you. Ali Akbar says, It is my time. And they say the first martyr in the family of the Prophet was Ali Akbar. The one, the first one to go. Imam Hussain, Imam Hussain says, you will represent me on this day. Abbas also, by the way, yesterday, just a quick point I want to make besides Ali Akbar. When Imam Ali salam, was on his deathbed, he was talking to Imam Hassan and giving him his wasiyah. Then he called Zainab salam, and then he talked... He called all his sons, but he left Abbas on the side. And Allah, Abbas was looking at his father like, where do I stand in this? Imam Ali looks at Abbas and calls him and says, come here. He takes the hand of Imam Hussein and Abbas and says, you hold in the two of you, for I'm planning this now. The same for Ali Akbar. As Ali Akbar grew up, Imam Hussein was planning him and saying, you will be my representative on the day of Ashura. So Ali Akbar comes and asks for permission from Imam Hussein. Imam looks at him and says, I wish you were a father. I wish you were a father. Ali Akbar looks at him and says, Tell me, father, what do you mean? He says, How can I let you go towards the enemy? As a father, my desire is to protect you forever. Ali Akbar says, Father, we are going to meet our grandfather. We are going to meet our father. We are going to meet our grandmother. We are going to meet them tomorrow, tonight, right now. As he gets on his horse, 
He's trying to move his horse and the horse is not moving. Ali Akbar looks behind. He sees his father still holding the reins of the horse. He said, I can't let you go. Ali Akbar looks at his father. He says, Inna lillah wa inna ilayhi raji'oon. Just this moment of departing, de departing from your beloved brothers, put it in our hearts till the day of judgment and say my sacrifice is for that. That I'm going to be an upright Muslim for what Ali Akbar has done for me and for the messenger of all the 20 year olds in this world. As he approaches the enemy, they say he was the Qamar of Bani Hashim. As he comes towards the enemy, people say, Wallahi, this is Rasulullah. <laughs> He's turning around looking at people and saying, that's the Prophet. We are killing the Prophet. He starts to recite poetry and says, you know who I am? I am the son of the most powerful agent of God on this earth. <laughs> who was my grandfather? And he's reciting the ode back and forth, telling the enemies, we are the chosen people of God. And he starts to strike the enemies and he kills many. We don't know the numbers exactly, but there were many because Ali Akbar was a very valiant 20 year old fighter. Eventually an enemy comes behind him and from next to him and lodges a javelin and it goes into his chest, into his heart. And Imam Hussein witnesses that. That moment you cannot take off in your life when you watch an, a, a javelin entering your son's heart. Imam quickly goes and secures his son. <laughs> the javelin is in his chest. As Ali Akbar is breathing his last. <laughs> the Imam pulls the javelin out and carries his body lifelessly as he has gone. Allah says, Ya ayatun nafsul mutma'inna irji'i ila rabbiki radiyatan mardiyya fadkhuli fi ibadi wa dkhuli jannati ala la'anatullah ala al-qawm al-zalimim. Zainab alayhi wa sallam, when she saw this, she lamented. She said, Hey, ah, what have they done to my nephew? Ala la'anatullah ala al-qawm al-zalimim. Mata Hussein. 